Stargazing, humankind's way to predict the future, to talk to the gods, and today to unlock the secrets of creation. Our tools, magnificent machines built by pioneers pushing the limits of technology, battling personal demons and public ridicule. Now, the great observatories from Stonehenge to Hubble on modern marvels. The science of modern telescopes is more fantastic than most science fiction. The sights gathered by these machines more spectacular than any imaginary visions. They extend our reach to the farthest corners of the utterly mysterious universe into which we were born. Early man yearned for a link between the mysterious lights in the sky and his daily life, envisioning the animals around him as patterns in the heavens. Thousands of years before Christ, peoples far removed from each other built great stone observatories to chart the cycles of the sun and the moon. From Egypt to the Americas, remains of these star charts dot the globe still. So important were the structures that generations endured back-breaking labor to complete them. Stonehenge was the pinnacle of what that technology was capable of producing in those times was something like 20,000 man years of effort to move these massive blocks from North Wales all the way down to the south of England, distance of several hundred miles. And this was probably without any beasts of burden to pull them. They were probably moved by hand, rolling on logs for that entire distance. So it was a huge effort and represented the best that that technology was capable of doing in terms of astronomical observatories. For thousands of years, mankind's celestial technology and his knowledge of the stars changed little. Then one fateful day in 1609, Dutch optician Hans Lippershey accidentally peered through two pairs of glasses and realized that the twin lenses magnified objects. The telescope was born. An Italian mathematics professor named Galileo Galilei saw the instrument's military potential demonstrating to the Senate of Venice that the so-called spyglass allowed incoming ships to be spotted two hours earlier than with the naked eye. A grateful Senate immediately doubled Galileo's salary. In 1612, Galileo turned his spyglass skyward and instantly saw ten times further than any previous human in time, his pioneering observations would reveal that the Earth rotates around the Sun, directly contradicting age-old beliefs that the Earth is the center of the universe. The Catholic Church was not amused. Galileo was brought before the Holy Roman Inquisition to stand trial for heresy. Under threat of torture, he publicly reaffirmed the Church's belief that the Earth is immovable. But as he was led away to what would be house arrest for the rest of his life and eventual blindness caused by staring at the sun, he whispered, Epure si muave, but it does move. The year 1868 saw the birth of a man like Galileo who would devote his heart and soul to the advancement of astronomy. George Ellery Hale. As a boy, Hale read Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon and was hooked on astronomy. By age 13, he was working with professional astronomers. Hale's self-appointed mission was to build ever more powerful telescopes, machines of staggering size and exquisite precision that would unveil the secrets of the universe. To accomplish this goal, he would brave a never-ending series of obstacles, including a lifelong struggle with mental illness. At times, the demons were literally crippling. He would wake up in the night and 
have a sense of, of little demons coming and talking to him and telling him his life was worthless and everything he had done was worthless. And much of his life was a battle between these periods of extraordinary clarity when he was able to do what perhaps no other scientist or organizer of science could do and periods when he was almost incapacitated by these demons, when he would have to retire to a dark room. The dawn of the 20th century was an era of competition to build bigger and better machines. Ships, buildings, trains. Engineers raced to create more spectacular versions of each. Hale took advantage of this expansive spirit to raise money for his epic projects. In 1907, he began a decade-long effort to create a telescope with a 100-inch diameter mirror by far the most ambitious ever attempted. This instrument, if only he could find a way to build it, could hold the answers to ancient questions about the size and age of the universe. Hale took industrialist Andrew Carnegie by the hand, whining and dining him, demonstrating how telescopes work, awing him with the wondrous discoveries to come. The Carnegie Foundation did provide the needed funds, and over the next years, a dome arose atop remote Mount Wilson near Pasadena, California. Chosen for its clear air and distance from man-made lights, Mount Wilson would see workmen converge by the hundreds to transform Hale's dream into a reality of glass and steel. The great observatory was finally finished in 1917, but only the first sighting through the telescope known as First Light would reveal whether it worked. On a cold November night, Hale led 20 colleagues across a narrow wooden bridge to the dome. With them was poet Alfred Noyes, on hand to record the historic occasion of First Light at the world's mightiest telescope. Where was the gambler that would stake so much time, patience, treasure on a single throw? All their youth was fuel to the flame of this one work. One in a lifetime to the man of science, there comes this drama. If he fails, he fails utterly. Alfred Noyes, Watchers of the Night. Hale, who had aged from 39 to 49 over the course of the project, was given the honor of first view and turned the telescope on Jupiter. To his horror, not one but several overlapping images filled the eyepiece. The 100-inch mirror appeared fatally flawed, Hale's 10-year obsession an utter failure. But then a colleague recalled that workmen had left the dome open during the day. Perhaps residual heat was distorting the mirror. Hale must wait hours longer for the mirror to cool. And for those few hours, no one is quite sure whether they have a total dud on their hands or a magnificent new telescope. Hale and Walter Adams don't even sleep until they come back two and a half hours later, um, come back in, spin the telescope around to a new target, look in and sure enough see perhaps the clearest and most brilliant image anyone had ever seen through a telescope. Hale had built the 100-inch telescope but it was the observations of astronomer Edwin Hubble that would make it famous. High school basketball star, Rhodes Scholar, and World War I infantry veteran, Edwin Hubble gave up the study of law for astronomy because, as he said, astronomy matters. Hubble affected in, in almost every circumstance a British accent, he wasn't at all British, uh, a pipe, a tweed jacket, and a set of mannerisms that were really, if you want, English common room and sherry sipping. It didn't win him a lot of friends among fellow astronomers. But no one questioned Hubble's intellect or his determination. Night after grueling night, he guided the 100-inch telescope, exposing single photographs for hours, testing his commitment, his weary eyes, and his bladder control. And guiding means you have to sit with your eye at an eyepiece, watching a guide star, keep it on a crosshair, constantly throughout the entire exposure. 
and you're stuck there. And in the winter, you are really stuck because it's very cold at most observatories. Within a few years, Hubble's photographs answered the great astronomical question of the age, proving that the Milky Way is just one of innumerable galaxies. Our local cluster of stars, long thought to contain the entire universe, was but a small outpost, a drop in the cosmic ocean. And not only was the universe far larger than previously imagined, it was expanding at fantastic speeds. Edwin Hubble had discovered the first clues to solving the ultimate mystery, evidence that all we know or ever will know began in a Big Bang. Hubble's work on the 100-inch telescope had revealed new depths to the universe, but it would take an even mightier observatory to explore those depths. Master builder George Hale stood ready to meet the challenge. In 200 BC, Eratosthenes estimated the circumference of the Earth with over 99% accuracy by measuring the moving shadow cast by a stick in the ground. Observatories will continue in a moment on Modern Marvels. In the 1920s, George Hale set his sights on creating a machine capable of seeing a candle at 10,000 miles, 10 million times more sensitive than the human eye. Only with a massive 200-inch telescope could scientists explore the vast universe that Hubble had glimpsed. The largest scientific instrument ever built, the 200-inch, would weigh over 500 tons. Not simply a bigger version of earlier observatories, it was instead an entirely new beast, requiring revolutionary advances in a host of technologies. But Hale was 60 years old and in perilous health. Increasingly incapacitated by mental breakdowns, he had no time to lose. He zeroed in on his old friend Wycliffe Rose, a man fond of saying, make the peaks higher. Together, they persuaded the Rockefeller Foundation to provide $6 million, the biggest grant ever for a scientific project. This was the birth of big science in America, the beginning of a huge nationwide effort to study nature. When Hale announced the project in October 1928, newspapers around the globe went wild with excitement. They immediately dubbed the telescope the Giant Eye, and proclaimed it a landmark event in human history. Standing on the threshold of a vast, uncharted space to be penetrated by the 200-inch telescope, the scientific world is frankly a tiptoe with excitement. What, men are asking themselves, will the gigantic new telescope reveal? Los Angeles Times, October 29, 1928. And the public enthusiasm that followed was just amazing. It went from a little girl sending a dollar that she had saved up from her allowance to people congratulating Hale on, in a sense, reinventing the world, beginning our great age of science and achievement all over again. I think there's probably never been a response quite as enthusiastic and as overwhelming toward an instrument with such a benign purpose. When Hale predicted that the new telescope could take seven years to complete, he was called a pessimist. But he knew better than anyone that every stage of the project called for research and engineering never before attempted. Many doubted whether it was even possible to make such an enormous mirror. Nobody knew you could cast a piece of glass 200 inches in diameter successfully. And of course, without that, there is no telescope. The glass, the 200-inch mirror, is the light collecting part of the telescope and the focusing element of the telescope. And if that doesn't work, nothing works. Creating a large mirror involves pouring hundreds of buckets of molten glass into a mold. In this case, a 200-inch mold. The resulting disk must be free of bubbles or other imperfections. Corning Glassworks in Corning, New York, experimented with a new substance for this mirror, Pyrex glass. In March 1934, journalist Lowell Thomas used his national radio program to inform America 
that Corning was ready to create the 200-inch mirror. He heard about this mirror pouring, and in one of his nightly news broadcasts announced in the typical Lowell Thomas hyperbole that this was the single greatest event of the 20th century, and by which he did not mean even to exclude the First World War. And from that moment, the world just turned toward Corning and poured into Corning to see this event. And it became an incredible publicity show. Now, people in the galleries would, during the pouring, be singing, I'm seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. I mean, they had everything but an orchestra playing during this very delicate operation of trying to pour the largest chunk of glass ever poured. Only days later would the audience learn that the pour was a failure. Dozens of cords anchoring the disc in a honeycomb pattern had broken loose. Reattachment was impossible. Nine months later, Corning poured another disc, this time without spectators. But casting the mirror was just the first step. To prevent scarring, the 1500 degree molten mass was cooled by less than one degree a day, a process that would take 10 months. After six months of controlled cooling, the worst flooding in decades struck Corning. When the Chemung River overflowed its banks, rainwater surged towards the Corning factories. If power was lost, so was the mirror. The water level slowly rose, and despite all of the efforts and all of the pumping trucks and all of the men of Corning with jackhammers and sandbags, the water literally lapped to the top of the transformer. They got the one transformer they needed to keep the project alive out, really with about a minute to spare. And had that not happened, the mirror would have been lost. In 1936, the 40,000-pound chunk of glass was shipped west to the Caltech optical shop in Pasadena. Everywhere it went, the train was literally mobbed by people. There would be towns where the temperature was 20 degrees below zero, and all the schools were let out so the children could line the tracks and see this achievement of American technology go by. This was what we could do. This was achievement. This was the best of America. Even the Lindbergh baby kidnapping trial was knocked off the nation's front pages by news of the Mirror's journey west. George Hale's dream had become a part of American folklore. In April 1936, the great disc arrived in California. As locals rode shotgun down the streets of Pasadena, the mirror was escorted to the Caltech Optical Lab. In the excitement of the day, no one could have imagined that completion of the telescope still lay more than a decade away. While the public focused on the giant mirror, Hale and his colleagues turned to the many other challenges of creating an observatory. The dome, the telescope tube, the rotating device, all presented major obstacles. By the mid-1930s, Hale's brainchild occupied thousands of engineers, mechanics, and workmen from coast to coast. Mount Palomar, outside San Diego, was chosen as the site for the observatory. At 5,000 feet above sea level, Palomar is blessed with some of the clearest skies in the northern hemisphere. And appropriate enough, in Indian legend, the mountain served as a departure point for souls journeying to heaven. In Philadelphia, Westinghouse proudly unveiled the 50-foot-long, 150,000-pound tube designed to hold the mirror. This tube would eventually be mounted on a horseshoe bearing weighing 400,000 pounds, the heaviest single unit ever machined. Even when broken down into component pieces, the hardware was too big to ship by land. The giant steel blocks were loaded onto cargo vessels and taken by sea through the Panama Canal and up to California. These and a thousand other difficulties were conquered by Hale's leadership. He is, in effect, a one-person network bringing together industry, academia, government, scientists, and forcing them to work together in a way that has never occurred beforehand. Today, we have an agency like NASA or the National Science Foundation that spends all of its time doing exactly that. But George Hale is accomplishing that when there are no 
support structures. There are no institutions to do it. The Palomar Dome was the largest welded structure ever built, and every part of it demanded exact precision. The rails upon which it would rotate had to be smooth within a thousandth of an inch. Anything less would introduce a jitter into the photographed images. Only after six months and thousands of man hours of smoothing were the rails pronounced ready. The moving parts of the 200-inch telescope go 535 tons. And we talk about tolerances of thousands of an inch. To see that kind of precision in that size machine is a remarkable combination. The biggest enterprise in scientific history had grown beyond the longevity of its creators. In 1938, Francis Pease, the original designer of both the 100-inch and the 200-inch telescopes, died from complications of cancer surgery. And George Hale was failing fast. Now confined to a wheelchair, he approached the end with serenity. On February 18, 1938, he was wheeled outside, where he looked up at the sky and said, It is a beautiful day. The sun is shining and they are working on Palomar. Just days later, he died at age 69. Hale's colleagues continued to drive the project forward. As ever, the toughest challenge was perfecting the giant mirror. In the Caltech optical shop, 20 technicians operated in the ultimate clean room. If the slightest microscopic speck fell under a polishing brush, the mirror would be scratched, setting the process back months or even years. Marcus Brown, the single man connected with the telescope from origin to completion, protected his mirror with the zeal of a Secret Service agent guarding the president. Some people thought that Marcus Brown was almost a fanatic in terms of his disk. He would order a cleaning. As soon as they finished the cleaning, he would order them to clean the entire laboratory again. But he had become possessive. He was a, a man with a calling, and this was his masterpiece. And he ruled his optic shop as a dictator. Month after month, year after year, the 200-inch disk turned in a never-ending circle, polished with ever finer tools. Over five tons of glass were removed at the optical shop. As the 1930s came to a close, the mirror approached its goal, two millionth of an inch from optical perfection. If you want to understand how smoothly polished the glass is, try to imagine scaling that 15-foot mirror up to the size of the United States. If you do that, the highest mountains that the glass would have, or something on the order of six inches or so. It's an extremely well-polished piece of glass. In 1940, with the mirror on the verge of completion, the entire project fell victim to the demands of war. Workers and facilities were turned over to the war effort. The precious mirror crated up and put into storage. The noble search for answers to the riddles of the universe would have to pause before the barbarity of mankind. After the war, the mirror was brought out of storage and the task of polishing its surface resumed. Finally, in late 1947, after 11 years and 180,000 man-hours of grinding and polishing, the job was done. The 200-inch mirror was ready for its final journey to the top of Mount Palomar. Bellier Truck Company, who guaranteed to tackle anything from a building to a whale, was entrusted with the priceless cargo. A caravan of trucks escorted by 10 highway patrolmen crawled forward at a maximum 10 miles an hour. In the early morning hours, this cargo goes by. It's not been announced anywhere. And farmers first wake up, and other people wake up and see something go by. And it's not clear what it is, even. And then each village it would go through, each juncture on the street, someone would say, it's the giant eye. There would be a sort of hush, because people would 
have a sense that they would never again see anything quite like this. The 200-inch telescope had survived a depression, a world war, and the death of its creators. Two full decades, a human generation had passed between financing and completion. A long time in human terms, but insignificant on an astronomical time scale. On June 3, 1948, with George Hale's widow in attendance, the telescope was officially dedicated. As this great instrument probes the secrets of the universe, it is fitting that it should stand also in memory of the great scientist who contributed so brilliantly to the science of astronomy and who served so ably his community and his nation. Dr. Lee DeBridge, dedicating the Hale Telescope. For 30 years, the Hale Telescope would reign supreme as the finest observatory on Earth. Much of the history of 20th century cosmology and astronomy was written at Palomar. On this mountaintop, man for the first time saw the life and deaths of stars. It was here that the universe was revealed as twice larger than previously imagined. And even today, the telescope contributes daily to its continuing legacy. The 200-inch telescope and all optical telescopes in the world are always kept at the most critical edge of research capabilities. That was built into them by the people who designed it. It always amazes me how well built the 200-inch telescope is. It was built to last. The magnificent new machine came too late for the great astronomer Edwin Hubble, who died in 1953. But Hubble's name would endure, inspiring the next great leap in man's quest to know the heavens. Using the Palomar telescope, astronomers have discovered quasars up to 12 billion light years from Earth. Observatories will continue in a moment on modern marvels. From our home on Earth, we look out into the distance and strive to imagine the sort of world into which we were born. The search will continue. The urge is older than history. It is not satisfied and it will not be suppressed. Edwin Hubble. By the 1970s, astronomy was ready for its next leap in technology. The main limitation on all telescopes, even the hail, was distortion introduced by the Earth's atmosphere. The very twinkling of the stars is caused by this unsteady air. The solution, place an orbiting observatory high above the atmosphere. With a clear view of the stars, a space telescope would act as the eyes of the Earth. It could see to the very edge of the universe and the dawn of creation. What was soon named the Hubble Space Telescope grew into the most complex scientific instrument ever built. More than just a telescope, Hubble is actually a full-scale observatory, complete with cameras, computers, and a guidance system. Throughout the 1980s, over 10,000 people around the globe worked to create it. The European Space Agency built two giant solar arrays to power the craft each panel containing 48,800 postage-sized solar cells. Computers in Connecticut and California monitored polishing of the 94-inch primary mirror. Hubble's operations ground system, its brain, consumed 12,000 man-years of computer programming. Although a hefty 13 tons, Hubble is actually the most fragile of machines. On April 24, 1990, the space shuttle Discovery with Hubble aboard counted down to liftoff. Around the world, astronomers crossed their fingers. What you do is you build your telescope the best way you know how, and then you put it on top of a, a, a controlled explosion and hope that it'll make it to orbit all right. So for me, the biggest risk, and it was a nail-biting time during the launch, was that something drastic would go wrong. Three, two, 
one and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. When Hubble launched in, in April of 1990, it was a dream come true because many of us have worked on this program for decades, some, some even longer than my 20 years. And just seeing the shuttle going up there uh, was just incredible high. But then the problem started. NASA's plan called for the shuttle's long arm to lift Hubble into space. And everyone knew that this deployment was a period of maximum risk. Once in high orbit, the Discovery crew set about carefully freeing the $2 billion machine and its cargo bay. Discovery, you're going for umbilical disconnect. The slightest mistake could imperil the telescope. As if that were not pressure enough, the astronauts were forced to operate under a tight deadline. Unless the solar arrays were up and running in time, Hubble would be no more. We had to get those out and powered up because the batteries only had a charge for about six hours. And if those batteries ran down, the Hubble would have been dead. So once the shuttle released its own power system from the Hubble, we had to get those solar panels out in about six hours. So we're all frightened about that. One of the solar panels stuck, delaying separation and costing precious time. As the clock ticked down, Discovery's crew prepared for an emergency spacewalk. This is Mission Control Houston. Flight controllers here in uh, Mission Control Center discussing an impending deadline. The other thing I need an answer to is if I can go ahead and commit the EVA with the thought of going out and cranking it out. If, the, if whatever they're about to do fails, they want us to just press on to back them up. We need to get on with it. Okay, Flight, I'll come back with the answer. I need answers now. But we had the astronauts already getting their spacesuits on and getting ready for uh, to go outside and do a spacewalk to hand crank them out just in case. And we got within one or two hours before power ran out when the, when the solar panels finally came out. Discovery, go for Hubble release. Spacecraft Hubble was free at last, orbiting 380 miles above its home world. Aboard the space shuttle, astronauts celebrated the moment by recalling the telescope's namesake. We managed to obtain this device, which is the guiding eyepiece, we are assured, from the 100-inch telescope on which uh, Edwin Hubble did many of his observations out at Mount Wilson in California. So it's his fundamental work, in fact. The eyes of the Earth were ready to behold the origins of the Big Bang. Who could have thought that this dream come true would soon become astronomy's worst nightmare? Almost immediately, the solar panels caused problems. Every 45 minutes, Hubble moved from sunlight to darkness with an abrupt temperature shift of hundreds of degrees. The sharp temperature changes caused the arrays to contract or expand, shaking the delicate machine for several minutes. Hubble had a bad case of the jitters and no way to get rid of them. Tests over the next few weeks revealed an even more puzzling problem. Data from the 94-inch mirror simply didn't make sense. It seemed to indicate that the mirror could not focus. As the evidence mounted, no one was eager to confront the possibility of a major malfunction. The primary contractor who had built the mirror and the telescope and who was nominally in charge of helping to set up and align the optics was saying in this period that there wasn't a problem. So I was on the one hand saying there was a problem. The official contractor on the other hand was saying there wasn't a problem. And then all at once, the problem was too obvious to deny. A mistake in the primary mirror, an optical error one fortieth of the thickness of a human hair had left Hubble seriously flawed. The astronomical community was devastated. It was finally in late June that the final data came in and we couldn't deny it. And it was just a crushing blow. I mean, I remember getting a call on a Sunday afternoon and I was crushed. The mirror disaster was immediately followed by a public relations fiasco. 
The press and public savaged NASA for its apparent hubris and incompetence. Coming just four years after the space shuttle Challenger tragedy, Hubble's plight made many wonder if NASA could do anything right. The summer of 1990 was filled with scathing editorials and brutal cartoons. The most complex scientific instrument ever built had become a national joke. Congress would reconvene in September amid fears that the lawmakers would simply let Hubble die. If Congress had turned off the telescope that summer before we had a chance to fix it, uh, it would have been a, a death blow to American astronomy. Uh, the, we would probably never get a chance, within our lifetime certainly, to build another large optical telescope. And for those 10,000 people that had spent decades on this program, it would have been a personal tragedy. The impending tragedy threatened to consume everyone connected with it. As summer turned to fall in Washington, not only the Hubble telescope, but the future of NASA itself and America's space program hung in the balance. As the wounded Hubble telescope circled the Earth, an investigation traced its imperfection to human error. Computers had warned of problems with the mirror, warnings unaccountably ignored by optical supervisors. By a strange twist of fate, yet another human miscalculation would rescue Hubble. We were saved by Saddam Hussein. Before the invasion of Kuwait, there had been congressional and Senate hearings into it, and more promised in the fall. Well, then he invaded Kuwait, and I think um, that distracted the public opinion and gave us a window in which to fix the problem. In theory, Hubble's nearsightedness could be corrected by replacing its camera with one equipped with compensating lenses. A nickel-sized piece of corrective glass might restore its full vision. A shuttle crew of seven trained for nearly two years for the repair mission. They spent 400 hours in water tanks practicing maneuvering Hubble's refrigerator-sized components. But for Story Musgrave and his fellow astronauts, nothing mattered more than mental preparation. It's choreographing a dance such that five days of activity out there, you know precisely what body motions you're going to take, how you're going to fit into things, where all the 300 tools are going to be throughout that five days. You simply build a script that you can now follow through out there in space. When the shuttle Endeavour blasted off in a spectacular night launch in December 1993, it embarked on an extraordinarily complex and high-risk mission. Five full nights of spacewalks were planned, by far the most ever. The astronauts were charged with attempting a dozen difficult tasks. Insiders would have been glad to see half the repairs performed successfully. All the while transmitting pictures back to spellbound Earthlings. Endeavour began by capturing Hubble on its long arm. The first order of business was replacing the troublesome solar arrays with new, temperature-resistant panels. When one of the old arrays refused to go quietly, it was unceremoniously ejected into space. Replacing the arrays had been built into Hubble's design and was a relatively simple procedure. However, no one had anticipated the need to replace the solar array drive electronics. That task would require exceptional patience. I have a very bulky spacesuit that weighs about 500 pounds with me in it, and I'm riding on the end of a 60-foot arm, dealing with screws that are three millimeters and are non-captive. That task was excruciatingly painful. That was three hours of very, very hard work with three millimeter screws. And the reason being is because that job had not designed to be done by a spacewalker. Day three marked the critical moment of the mission. To correct Hubble's vision, the primary camera would be replaced, and that meant removing the mirror's protective cover. Human hands would be moving large, unwieldy objects just six inches from the mirror's surface. 
even the slightest of touching on the Hubble surface, you are making dust which could end up on the optics. Every time you have to tie yourself down or some other instrument and you put a metal hook, metal to metal, you're worried about flake and you're worried about scarring. We were very, very concerned about the threat that we were to Hubble. When we got that camera in and they turned it on to make sure it was working, and it was working, <laughs> that was a great, great, great relief. I think everything after that was sort of anticlimactic. Getting that camera in was the number one priority because that was the camera that was going to do all the science that we always promised. The Endeavour repair mission succeeded beyond NASA's wildest dreams. Every one of the dozen planned tasks was carried out flawlessly. With its vision restored, Hubble allowed humans to see ten times more clearly than ever before. The same jump in resolution as when Galileo first pointed his spyglass towards the sky. This photo of Galaxy M100 was taken by Hubble in 1990. Here, the same region viewed by the repaired telescope. It's very, very exciting time to be doing astronomy. And everybody has their favorite objects, which they have studied for many years. And when you finally get the opportunity to take a Hubble picture of those objects, you'll suddenly see things that you hadn't suspected. You'll see things that you'd long suspected but really wanted to prove. You know, you'll always learn something new. Hubble has put some of astronomy's most treasured imaginings to the test. What Hubble did was looked at the center of a galaxy where we suspected there might be a black hole. A black hole is an object that is very, very dense and very, very small. So dense and so tiny that the speed of escape from that object exceeds the speed of light. So nothing can get out of it. Everything just gets sucked into it and disappears from the universe. Black holes have been fantasy and science fiction for, for decades. And what Hubble has done now is it's shown us that black holes are scientific fact. Hubble was made possible by the 10,000 humans who labored so long to conceive, build, and repair it. But even more, it is the direct descendant of those men whose thirst for knowledge would not be denied. Galileo sacrificing his freedom to put the sun at the center of our universe. George Hale overcoming his demons to build ever greater observatories. And Edwin Hubble guiding a telescope for eight hours in a freezing dome to capture evidence of an expanding universe. People really yearn to understand the stars, the universe, because that's where we came from. We are children of the stars in the sense that the chemical elements in our bodies were cooked in stars. The carbon, the calcium, all the good stuff in our bodies were cooked inside the nuclear furnaces of stars. And then those stars blew up and sent those chemicals all over the universe. And luckily, some of them collected here in the solar system. Mankind has always been a race of stargazers. The tools change, the yearning remains the same. To know whence we came, Writing in 1902 at the dawn of our great age of astronomical discovery, H.G. Wells foresaw the adventure that lay ahead. It is possible that all the human mind has ever accomplished is but the dream before the awakening. A day will come when beings who are now latent in our thoughts and hiding in our minds shall stand upon this earth as one stands upon a footstool and shall laugh and reach out their hands amidst the stars. Stargazing. Humankind's way to predict the future, to talk to the gods, and today to unlock the secrets of creation. Our tools, magnificent machines built by pioneers pushing the limits of technology, battling personal demons and public ridicule. Now, the great observatories from Stonehenge to Hubble on Modern Marvels. The 
The science of modern telescopes is more fantastic than most science fiction. The sights gathered by these machines more spectacular than any imaginary visions. They extend our reach to the farthest corners of the utterly mysterious universe into which we were born. Early man yearned for a link between the mysterious lights in the sky and his daily life, envisioning the animals around him as patterns in the heavens. Thousands of years before Christ, peoples far removed from each other built great stone observatories to chart the cycles of the sun and the moon. From Egypt to the Americas, remains of these star charts dot the globe still. So important were the structures that generations endured back-breaking labor to complete them. Stonehenge was the pinnacle of what that technology was capable of producing in those times. It was something like 20,000 man-years of effort to move these massive blocks from North Wales all the way down to the south of England, a distance of several hundred miles. And this was probably without any beasts of burden to pull them. They were probably moved by hand, rolling on logs for that entire distance. So it was a huge effort and represented the best that that technology was capable of doing in terms of astronomical observatories. For thousands of years, mankind's celestial technology and his knowledge of the stars changed little. Then one fateful day in 1609, Dutch optician Hans Lippershey accidentally peered through two pairs of glasses and realized that the twin lenses magnified objects. The telescope was born. An Italian mathematics professor named Galileo Galilei saw the instrument's military potential, demonstrating to the Senate of Venice that the so-called spyglass allowed incoming ships to be spotted two hours earlier than with the naked eye. A grateful Senate immediately doubled Galileo's salary. In 1612, Galileo turned his spyglass skyward and instantly saw ten times further than any previous human. In time, his pioneering observations would reveal that the Earth rotates around the Sun, directly contradicting age-old beliefs that the Earth is the center of the universe. The Catholic Church was not amused. Galileo was brought before the Holy Roman Inquisition to stand trial for heresy. Under threat of torture, he publicly reaffirmed the Church's belief that the Earth is immovable. But as he was led away to what would be house arrest for the rest of his life and eventual blindness caused by staring at the sun, he whispered, Epure si muave, but it does move. The year 1868 saw the birth of a man like Galileo who would devote his heart and soul to the advancement of astronomy, George Ellery Hale. As a boy, Hale read Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon and was hooked on astronomy. By age 13, he was working with professional astronomers. Hale's self-appointed mission was to build ever more powerful telescopes machines of staggering size and exquisite precision that would unveil the secrets of the universe. To accomplish this goal, he would brave a never-ending series of obstacles, including a lifelong struggle with mental illness. At times, the demons were literally crippling. He would wake up in the night and have a sense of, of little demons coming and talking to him and telling him his life was worthless and everything he had done was worthless and much of his life was a battle between these periods of extraordinary clarity when he was able to do what perhaps no other scientist or organizer of science could do and periods when he was almost incapacitated by these demons when he would have to retire to a dark room the dawn of the 20th century was an era of competition to build bigger and better machines ships buildings trains Engineers raced to create more spectacular versions of each. Hale took advantage of this expansive spirit to raise money for his epic projects. In 1907, he began a decade-long effort to create a telescope 
with a 100-inch diameter mirror, by far the most ambitious ever attempted. This instrument, if only he could find a way to build it, could hold the answers to ancient questions about the size and age of the universe. Hale took industrialist Andrew Carnegie by the hand, whining and dining him, demonstrating how telescopes work, awing him with the wondrous discoveries to come. The Carnegie Foundation did provide the needed funds, and over the next years, a dome arose atop remote Mount Wilson near Pasadena, California. Chosen for its clear air and distance from man-made lights, Mount Wilson would see workmen converge by the hundreds to transform Hale's dream into a reality of glass and steel. The great observatory was finally finished in 1917, but only the first sighting through the telescope known as First Light would reveal whether it worked. On a cold November night, Hale led 20 colleagues across a narrow wooden bridge to the dome. With them was poet Alfred Noyes, on hand to record the historic occasion of first light at the world's mightiest telescope. Where was the gambler that would stake so much time, patience, treasure on a single throw? All their youth was fuel to the flame of this one work. One in a lifetime to the man of science, there comes this drama. If he fails, he fails utterly. Alfred Noyes, Watchers of the Night. Hale, who had aged from 39 to 49 over the course of the project, was given the honor of first view and turned the telescope on Jupiter. To his horror, not one but several overlapping images filled the eyepiece. The 100-inch mirror appeared fatally flawed. Hale's 10-year obsession an utter failure. But then a colleague recalled that workmen had left the dome open during the day. Perhaps residual heat was distorting the mirror. Hale must wait hours longer for the mirror to cool. And for those few hours, no one is quite sure whether they have a total dud on their hands or a magnificent new telescope. Hale and Walter Adams don't even sleep until they come back two and a half hours later, um, come back in, spin the telescope around to a new target, look in and sure enough see perhaps the clearest and most brilliant image anyone had ever seen through a telescope. Hale had built the 100-inch telescope but it was the observations of astronomer Edwin Hubble that would make it famous. High school basketball star, Rhodes Scholar, and World War I infantry veteran, Edwin Hubble gave up the study of law for astronomy because, as he said, astronomy matters. Hubble affected, in, in almost every circumstance, a British accent. He wasn't at all British. Uh, a pipe, a tweed jacket, and a set of mannerisms that were really, if you want, English common room and sherry sipping. It didn't win him a lot of friends among fellow astronomers. But no one questioned Hubble's intellect or his determination. Night after grueling night, he guided the 100-inch telescope, exposing single photographs for hours, testing his commitment, his weary eyes, and his bladder control. And guiding means you have to sit with your eye at an eyepiece, watching a guide star, keep it on a crosshair, constantly throughout the entire exposure. And you're stuck there. And in the winter, you are really stuck because it's very cold at most observatories. Within a few years, Hubble's photographs answered the great astronomical question of the age, proving that the Milky Way is just one of innumerable galaxies. Our local cluster of stars, long thought to contain the entire universe, was but a small outpost, a drop in the cosmic ocean. And not only was the universe far larger than previously imagined, it was expanding at fantastic speeds. Edwin Hubble had discovered the first clues to solving the ultimate mystery, evidence that all we know or ever will know began in a Big Bang.
Hubble's work on the 100-inch telescope had revealed new depths to the universe, but it would take an even mightier observatory to explore those depths. Master builder George Hale stood ready to meet the challenge. In 200 BC, Eratosthenes estimated the circumference of the Earth with over 99% accuracy by measuring the moving shadow cast by a stick in the ground. Observatories will continue in a moment on Modern Marvels. In the 1920s, George Hale set his sights on creating a machine capable of seeing a candle at 10,000 miles, 10 million times more sensitive than the human eye. Only with a massive 200-inch telescope could scientists explore the vast universe that Hubble had glimpsed. The largest scientific instrument ever built, the 200-inch, would weigh over 500 tons. Not simply a bigger version of earlier observatories, it was instead an entirely new beast, requiring revolutionary advances in a host of technologies. But Hale was 60 years old and in perilous health. Increasingly incapacitated by mental breakdowns, he had no time to lose. He zeroed in on his old friend Wycliffe Rose, a man fond of saying, make the peaks higher. Together they persuaded the Rockefeller Foundation to provide six million dollars, the biggest grant ever for a scientific project. This was the birth of big science in America. The beginning of a huge nationwide effort to study nature. When Hale announced the project in October 1928, newspapers around the globe went wild with excitement. They immediately dubbed the telescope the Giant Eye and proclaimed it a landmark event in human history. Standing on the threshold of a vast uncharted space to be penetrated by the 200-inch telescope, the scientific world is frankly a tiptoe with excitement. What, men are asking themselves, will the gigantic new telescope reveal? Los Angeles Times, October 29, 1928. And the public enthusiasm that followed was just amazing. It went from a little girl sending a dollar that she had saved up. Stargazing. Humankind's way to predict the future. To talk to the gods. And today to unlock the secrets of creation. Our tools, magnificent machines built by pioneers pushing the limits of technology. Battling personal demons and public ridicule. Now, the great observatories, from Stonehenge to Hubble, on Modern Marvels. The science of modern telescopes is more fantastic than most science fiction. The sights gathered by these machines more spectacular than any imaginary visions. They extend our reach to the farthest corners of the utterly mysterious universe into which we were born. Early man yearned for a link between the mysterious lights in the sky and his daily life, envisioning the animals around him as patterns in the heavens. Thousands of years before Christ, Peoples far removed from each other built great stone observatories to chart the cycles of the sun and the moon. From Egypt to the Americas, remains of these star charts dot the globe still. So important were the structures that generations endured back-breaking labor to complete them. Stonehenge was the pinnacle of what that technology was capable of producing in those times was something like 20,000 man years of effort to move these massive blocks from North Wales all the way down to the south of England, a distance of several hundred miles. And this was probably without any beasts of burden to pull them. They were probably moved by hand, rolling on logs for that entire distance. So it was a huge effort and represented the best that that technology was capable of doing in terms of astronomical observatories. For thousands of years, mankind's celestial technology and his knowledge of the stars changed little. Then one fateful day in 1609, Dutch optician Hans Lippershey accidentally peered through two pairs of glasses 
and realized that the twin lenses magnified objects. The telescope was born. An Italian mathematics professor named Galileo Galilei saw the instrument's military potential, demonstrating to the Senate of Venice that the so-called spyglass allowed incoming ships to be spotted two hours earlier than with the naked eye. A grateful Senate immediately doubled Galileo's salary. In 1612, Galileo turned his spyglass skyward and instantly saw ten times further than any previous human. In time, his pioneering observations would reveal that the Earth rotates around the Sun directly contradicting age-old beliefs that the Earth is the center of the universe. The Catholic Church was not amused. Galileo was brought before the Holy Roman Inquisition to stand trial for heresy. Under threat of torture, he publicly reaffirmed the Church's belief that the Earth is immovable. But as he was led away to what would be house arrest for the rest of his life and eventual blindness caused by staring at the sun, he whispered, Epure si muave, but it does move. The year 1868 saw the birth of a man like Galileo who would devote his heart and soul to the advancement of astronomy, George Ellery Hale. As a boy, Hale read Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon and was hooked on astronomy. By age 13, he was working with professional astronomers. Hale's self-appointed mission was to build ever more powerful telescopes, machines of staggering size and exquisite precision that would unveil the secrets of the universe. To accomplish this goal, he would brave a never-ending series of obstacles, including a lifelong struggle with mental illness. At times, the demons were literally crippling. He would wake up in the night and have a sense of, of little demons coming and talking to him and telling him his life was worthless and everything he had done was worthless. And much of his life was a battle between these periods of extraordinary clarity when he was able to do what perhaps no other scientist or organizer of science could do and periods when he was almost incapacitated by these demons, when he would have to retire to a dark room. The dawn of the 20th century was an era of competition to build bigger and better machines. Ships, buildings, trains. Engineers raced to create more spectacular versions of each. Hale took advantage of this expansive spirit to raise money for his epic projects. In 1907, he began a decade-long effort to create a telescope with a 